Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mimi. It's great to be here with you at at our third virtual museum night, Alice in Museum Land. Um, we're really excited tonight to introduce uh, Maggie Taylor, an artist who's going to be showing an exhibition at the Han um, called Dreaming Alice. Uh, the heart is currently closed, but we are really excited to engage with all of you virtually. Um, this is a really cool way that we can still reach all of our audiences and um, hopefully you enjoy as well. There will be um, Q&A and we are accepting questions in the chat feature of the YouTube stream um, as well as Facebook. So feel free as you watch to ask your questions for Maggie um, and we'll be sure to answer those. So I will now hand it over to Eric Siegel, Director of Education at the Harn, who will introduce Maggie Taylor. Thank you, Mimi. We'll be seeing you at the end of the program. Thanks for being our host. And I'll go ahead and say farewell to you for a moment. Uh, there we go. Uh, welcome to Museum Nights again. It's great to have you all here. I am not in the museum, of course. I'm online with you all. Uh, it's great to be sharing this space. Um, we look forward to when we can share the museum space together. My background is virtual, of course. And uh, let me go ahead and bring Maggie in and I can say a few more words about that background. And uh, here we go. Welcome, Maggie. I hope I'm not surprising you. Hi. Did I, ca did I catch you off guard? Hi. Welcome, Maggie. We are live and online. Uh, museum Nights. Uh, this is Museum Nights, Alice in Museum Land. It is um, dedicated to and inspired by your work. Your work, which is being installed at the Harn now. The installation is not complete. Um, my virtual background, I was just mentioning to our audiences, is a photograph of the space partially installed. And you can see there are lots of works on view um, behind me to my, my right. Um, and it is really beautiful. Um, I've had a chance to look around, but it's not done yet. Um, but the works are completed and we're really excited that you're sharing them with us. How are you doing tonight, Maggie? I'm great. I'm glad we're not having a thunderstorm right now because earlier it was very noisy here. Yes, that's right. A whole lot of um, uh, unforeseen things arise in this new space. Um, so uh, I have lots of questions myself, which we may not even get to because I have a feeling we will have lots of questions from our visitor audience participants, friends. And I invite all of you to please um, share your questions and comments and thoughts through the YouTube live chat box. If you'll enter questions there, we will have a chance to um, share them with Maggie and talk to her about answer, you know, talk to her about your, what the things that interest you. Um, this is your second exhibition on the work of Lewis Carroll. That, well, it's your second project and the second time we, we presented it at the Harn. You, your previous project was Alice's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, that's like, there we go. At an angle, maybe. No, it's like it's it's very Wonderlandish. You cannot see it, but it's here. <laughs> it's the Cheshire Cat or something. Uh, it's a fabulous book um, when you can see it magically. <laughs> and um, there's a, there's a, there's also a catalog for the current exhibition, which is um, oh, Sten has <laughs> which is um, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Oh, that looks so much better. I don't have the fake background, so I can show There you go. Yes, you're in a real space. And your yeah. real space is your studio. We're going to go on a studio tour later on. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I did want to say, so there is also a catalog of this exhibition, and it's beautiful. Um, I have a copy, but it's at work where I can't get my hands on it because I can't go to work yet, but very soon. Um, Maggie, you've been working um, for, I think, 24 years with digital art and photography um, and uh, constructing images, uh, engaging with uh, the history of photography and sort of bookending it from the 
beginnings to the present with your work. It's really wonderful. And I know you're going to take us on a bit of a tour of your work. Um, and maybe uh, before we jump in, if you could just tell us a few things about the the project overall, its dimensions, the numbers of works, what in, uh, and what's on view at the Harn, or what's going to be on view at the Harn when we're open and it's finally finished installing. Right. So there are 60 four pieces in the book. And actually there's 65 pieces in the show because there's one that I did slightly after the fact that is a piece that includes all of the girls that are in every Alice that's in there, 22 different girls. Um, not every image has Alice in it out of the 64 because there's so many other characters in the story, everything from animals to other people, kings and queens and so on. So there are a lot of images with, without Alice in them. Um, and there's a range of sizes, like some of the images are smaller and some are 60 inches. So a few are quite big, like you can see behind Eric there, there's at least one that's a very large one of Tweedledee and Tweedledum, which was fun to see them in such a large scale as that. Um, and it's something that took me a, a long time. I mean, as I, I have a little keynote thing that I can talk a little about, but I mean, I, I worked on it for, three years full time. And before that I was collecting stuff for many years, knowing that I needed more daguerreotypes of girls and so on. Wow, so it's a real commitment. It, it speaks to how interested you were in, in Alice as a character in the um, Lewis Carroll stories. And I think that'd be fun to talk about after our viewers see a little bit more of your work because some of them haven't had a chance to see more than what's behind me right now. So should we jump right into your your keynote presentation? Yes, if I can understand the technology. I have to <laughs> empower you to share your screen. Okay. I, I will make you a co-host to do so. Who knows? Okay, then I'm gonna click share screen and keynote and share. Now, maybe you see the girl with the bee dress. Do you see that? Yes, I do. She looks beautiful. It's a nice large image. And is bright enough and everything. I hope it's okay. It is. Okay. So I first just wanted to mention like for people who have been to the Harn over the years and they're kind of wondering, does this look familiar? Well, yes, there's a reason it might look familiar. The Harn owns a couple of larger pieces of my work. They have this girl with a V dress and um, this large image called um, the moth house and another one also. And then you also have lots and lots of the original Alice in Wonderland work. So if people think, oh, maybe I saw something there before. Well, yep, it's been interwoven into other exhibits nicely over time. Um, and basically I've been using a lot of 19th century photography in my work for years. I've been doing Photoshop full-time since 1997 and before that, just experimenting with it a bit. And before that, I was a photographer. But um, I, I like to collect daguerreotypes and retouch them and then imagine what to do with them. And I don't start out with a preconceived idea of exactly what they would be. So, you know, I could spend days just fixing this image that I scan in because it has so many things called spider molds on it and then end up with that image in the end. So in 2006, I started working on an Alice in Wonderland project, which was exhibited at the Harn in 2008. And that's another thing people might have been familiar with there. They might've seen that show before. Um, and that really started because my general work before, which was kind of loosely, I would term it as surreal artwork. It was, um, it contained rabbits and holes in the ground and Victorian girls, among other things. And the man who ran the gallery in Santa Fe that showed my work for many years suggested to me, you know, you might want to um, consider doing an illustrations of Alice in Wonderland. And I thought, no, 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 I'm not interested in that. But then eventually I went back and read through the original book and thought, oh, wow, there's so much more in there than what I remember from the Disney movie growing up. There's so many characters and poems and interesting things. And I have all these photographs of Victorian girls. So at that time, these were things that were in my collection. 
These are all daguerreotypes except the one on the bottom left there that's an old Russian postcard. So I had all kinds of amazing material of girls that lived roughly at the same time as the original Alice. And then I just started putting things together. And at first I only had eight or nine images, like the key images people would think of the tea party, like this is the back of the Mad Hatter, or this is the white rabbit as the herald looking kind of forlorn before the courtroom scene. Um, and then this is Alice at the end of the book when she wakes up and that whole book is based on a card game and cards and queen of hearts, people remember that. Um, but things have been changed so much with different movies made over the years that we're familiar with. So it was kind of fun to go back and just think I'm free to reinterpret the original text. So then I did that and that project was done, 45 images done and the book came out and so on. And I just really loved Through the Looking Glass, which was another 12 chapters, but I didn't feel like I should launch directly into that. So I spent six or eight years doing other work of my own work and then decided what the heck, I might as well take some of these things I've collected. And I did a bunch of research in the meantime too so I, for example, I went, I went to Oxford, England. I went to the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas in Austin. They have a great collection of the original um, albums made by Lewis Carroll. So I was just going and like looking for more information and inspiration, basically. And one of the things I did in that time was I went to Laycock Abbey in England, and. That's the place where William Henry Fox Talbot lived and he was one of the inventors of photography. So in like 1837 to 39, he, in like, you know, a long time ago, he invented the paper negative process and how you could fix a photograph. So this is his house, uh, slightly made more symmetrical and like architectural modifications I put in there a bit. And I thought that is the perfect looking glass house. Because if we think back, like to me, the looking glass is kind of the camera. It's not just the mirror, but it's like our everyday camera now. So there was oh, a window yeah. in that house that is called an Oriole window. It's like a style of window, you see it there. And the image on the right is Fox Talbot's first existing photograph. It's like the first photograph and it's of that window. So I went there and got the chance to photograph there. And I thought that's what I want to be the background for Looking Glass House, just to have that reference. So this is the one of the earlier images in the series that's Alice in, in, in front of that window in Looking Glass House. And in the story, she walks through Looking Glass House. She has a little trouble getting out the other side. And when she comes out, it's more summery. It doesn't feel like that cold November day with a fire. It's more like she's going to walk out into the garden of live flowers and flowers are going to be talking to her and so on. So um, there are all kinds of strange things that happen to her in the story. It's kind of loosely based on a chess game or a chess problem and she proceeds as a pawn. So she starts on the second row of squares and has to jump six different brooks as she goes on her way to becoming a queen, like getting to the other end of the chessboard. This is one of the first brooks she jumps in a railway car with a man in a white paper suit. And there were all kinds of references back then that we don't really get now. So the man in the white paper suit was actually supposed to be Benjamin Disraeli, but people now wouldn't get that. They think he's just a weird guy who actually happened to be my husband posing in a white paper suit outside. <laughs> There are poems within the story that are so amazing. The Jabberwocky poem is one that many people had to memorize in grade school years ago. I know I did. It's kind of fun. It's a nonsense poem. And this one is made up of pieces of alligator engravings. So it's sort of a gator fish Jabberwocky monster. Um, the photographs of the girls are very long exposures. So they don't have um, they don't smile, they don't blink, they don't do much because they had to hold very, very still to have their photos made back then. This girl is from about 1850. And so I take them apart and add things to them. These are Tweedledee and Tweedledum that are the same boy cloned and morphed in Photoshop. And later on, Tweedledee and Tweedledum give Alice a big poem about 
um, the walrus and the carpenter. That's a famous poem that also a lot of people have had to recite over the years. This is another of Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Mm, this is a really beautiful daguerreotype. And I made, I decided I would make her the white queen because the white queen is kind of a little confused and forlorn and she, she lives backwards in time. So she has all kinds of stories to tell Alice. Was that previous image colorized before uh, in its original? No, that the original had some color, blue color on the dress and pink, pink on the cheeks and pink on the flowers. Yeah, yeah. Later. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of them were, but most of the hand coloring has radically faded. So I, I basically take it all out and start again and add other patterns and textures. So I added a butterfly pattern or moth pattern to her whole dress to give it more of a fabric texture. And then the white queen interacts with Alice and this girl just seems so perfect, but I had to cut the brother out of the picture there. And, and make her a little more symmetrical with her dress and everything. So sometimes it's cutting and pasting in Photoshop. This is one that has the Ichitakni as a background and it's supposed to be the White Queen and Alice in a boat talking. They have a really weird experience. It's like the heart of the book, chapter five, and it's really wonderful. It's my favorite, but um, the White Queen morphs into a sheep while they're talking. So in the reflections in the water here, you can see the white queen and Alice, but the real ones in the boat, the queen calls Alice a little goose and Alice sees her as a sheep. So it's mm. kind of, it was kind of fun. And Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty is from regular nursery rhymes. Like he existed before this book that Lewis Carroll wrote but he becomes a character in the book that's kind of slightly strange. And he insults Alice and tells her it would be easier if you, you weren't all the same, you people. Like, why don't you have two eyes on one side of your face or have your lips on your forehead or something? So I didn't want to make anything too gruesome. And I thought this could be a way to interpret that is that she has this banner, little flag thing, mask in front of her face. This might go on too long, Eric, just tell me. No, no, this is wonderful. People are making all sorts of comments about how much they appreciate their learning about your work, so. <laughs> so this is um, the first version of the lion and the unicorn that are supposed to be fighting because they're on the sort of British national coat of arms or emblem or whatever you call that, the lion and the unicorn, they're everywhere. So, and this was a kind of scrawny little unicorn. I made him out of a horse engraving and it was kind of tough and the boxing gloves look like they're going to cause him to pass out or something. So in the end, I got a much more husky, muscular uh -huh. unicorn. And then, you know, I tried, they were fighting over the crown. So I thought, well, maybe the crown should be in the air, but I didn't love that. And then so it talks about in this particular little poem that this is about in the story, that they're fighting all around the town and it mentions all the dust. So I thought the dust could actually be a really good thing. And then finally adding just these last little elements of like the butterfly in the mane with some ribbons, like he won some award and the glasses on the lion. Then I was a lot happy with it, but that, that took like four weeks of like going over and over and over it. Well, this is one of my favorites, this one. This is called, Do You Like Plum Cake Monster? Because those two, the lion and the unicorn, ask her. At the end, they say, do you like plum cake? And they want her to pass around some plum cake. And it turns out the plum cake cuts itself, which is a weird thing. Like she's not allowed to cut it. It just has an automatic slicer type of a thing. So let's see what else. Um, this is the start of an image about a dog where it's a riddle about a dog that I won't even go into now. But as I started, I knew I wanted all these ideas coming out of the dog's head. So I pulled in different elements and tried to shade them and stuff. And then I realized they didn't look right coming directly out of the dog's head like that. And so I needed to put a device there. So this is like, like a helmet that amplifies the dog's thoughts about like squirrel and steak and a can. So there's a few modern elements in there. Mm. 
at the end of the book, and this is true of both books, there's a big scene where all mayhem takes place and then it's like a crash at the end of the book. So the first book in Alice in Wonderland, it's a courtroom scene. In this book, and that ends in like cards swirling and Alice passing out and waking up on the riverbank. In this book, it is a feast scene. So I started with this thinking about like I needed a big sort of a banquet scene. It has to have the red queen, the white queen and Alice and a zillion different animals in it. And I tried to figure out how to make that room look okay and what all animals would have to be there. So it took a long time just trying to kind of piece in different ones and figure out mm, what which animal looks good in front of another one. Mm. And then it started to look like a movie scene in the background. I thought it looked like a drive-in movie or something. And I tried different plates on the table and candles and spoons. And that's my grandmother's china. I just tried all different things. And I kind of liked that after the end of like two or three weeks of working on it. And then I realized, no, it needs Alice and the two queens because you see that one, it has no Alice. It has all these cool animals, but it felt like it's missing the point. It has to be Alice and the Red Queen and White Queen. So the finished version of it, I just got rid of the whole tablecloth and everything and decided the animals are just all leaning in on her. That's a major change after several weeks of working with that table, Maggie. Can I ask, was it hard to let go of the table and even more so to let go of your grandmother's china or? <laughs> Yeah, and after you spent hours and hours scanning that in and retouching it, yeah, it's hard. So, um, are you very disciplined about making those decisions when you believe it's the right aesthetic choice? Yeah, sometimes you just wake up in the morning and you think it's worth trying that, and then it's like, I don't care if it takes me six hours today, but it's worth trying that because it could be better. Mm. You know? And definitely here, the whole point was it needed to be about Alice and the two queens. They were kind of supporting her and helping her to be a queen. It was kind of a motherly scene in some way. So it seemed wrong to have it just about the funky animals, no matter how cute they were. Yeah. So anyway, it's almost like a bridal gown or communion gown or something. And then right after that, the white queen disappears into the soup. So that's when the mayhem breaks loose. And <laughs> there's like a leg of mutton runs across the table and everybody's fighting. And so it's kind of crazy. So these are just the last few ones that I'll show, but at the end of the book, they talk about the fact that you're not sure if Alice dreamed the whole story or if the Red King dreamed the whole story. And it's weird that they pick him, not the queen, because she was more a part of the story, but it's either Alice or the Red King. One of them imagined the whole thing. So I, I started to work on this thinking, well, this is Alice imagining everything, like everything from the book. And I was kind of locked into that circle background for a while, but then I realized, no, we should maybe give her a little more space, maybe even have her be semi-transparent if we don't know if she's the one imagining or if she's being imagined, we don't know. So in the end, that image looked like this, and it has something from like all the 12 chapters in it. And then this is the companion one that's the Red King dreaming something from all the 12 chapters. And he, he's a little more sinister looking. I mean, he's definitely older, and a little strange, but he has a very similar background. So I realized the two of them go really nicely together. Um, one of them has a background that's something I photographed from my cell phone in Austria years ago. And the other one has something in Yosemite. So mm -hmm. it's a mix. Then I thought there's one other image I still really wanted to make for the book. And I had been to the Dolly Museum in St. Pete, and this is one of my favorite Salvador Dolly paintings. I love the fact that you have these three layers of stuff, like something on the table, it's super small, people in the middle ground are medium sized and monuments or buildings in the upper level, they're the same size. So I wanted to do something like that because there's a key scene where the white queen tells Alice that she can believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So I tried to work with that. I'm like, well, maybe these could be six impossible things of some sort. This was like a little early sketch of it, taking things from my other work over the years. And in the end, when once I looked at that dolly thing, I realized, no, I gotta go with those colors. And 
I was even able to lift some of the fabric from a snapshot of the dolly painting. So I ended up with nine things, but I like it better because it's more like that original dolly thing. Mm. Um, so I figure it's supposed to be, I can believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So I think the items on the table are the breakfast and the other are the six impossible things. Like you could have a cupcake or an egg or maybe even a beetle as your guest for breakfast or something like that. So then it becomes a triptych like that. And I, that's my favorite thing. And I thought I would use those as the book cover. So that's the end of my little presentation there. And these are just all different elements. I mean, sometimes I photograph things Sometimes I scan things and sometimes I just make them up in Photoshop or I lift them from eBay on the internet. You never know. So now how do I stop my- Thank oh, you so much, Maggie. Uh, let's see if you, at the top, you might see a red button that says stop sharing. That's tricky. I think I have to go back to Zoom to do that. Maybe don't I? I can- Stop share. Yeah. All right. So it looks like it's just you and me here for a moment. Yeah. That's great. You know, wonderful. Wonderful. The images are so beautiful and to um, have a sense of the, the intense process uh, gives us a sense of this is a, a large project you took on. Uh, it wasn't um, a small task. Um, let's see. I wanted to ask you maybe to just start out by um, thinking about process, and then maybe that will lead us into asking some more questions from some of our, our audience um, participants here, or viewers. Um, I, I get the sense that you thrive in the process, you discover the images as you work, you sort of, um, you don't create with a preconception necessarily. Um, I think you've mentioned, called it in the past, a playful or organic process of interacting with the image. And you once said, Quote, I don't start out with an idea and say, I woke up and had a dream of a girl holding a saw and a watermelon um, and say to myself, now I will illustrate that. You said it never works that way. Um, and I, you really shown us that with your examples, the experimentation, the thinking and rethinking, but you also did start with a project of illustrating a text. Did you, do you feel a tension when you know you have to um, serve the master of the text? Um, or is that stimulating and challenging for you? It was, and it was the only time, these two times of these two projects of Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland that I did that. And I was afraid to do it because I thought I don't wanna to have to do something that someone else wants me to do. But the fact that the person who wrote the text is long dead and many, many other people have illustrated it over the years was kind of freeing in a way. You know, but it's definitely true. I, I don't write things down beforehand and I didn't work in order at all. So I just read the book and if something felt particularly inspiring to me, like if I thought, oh my gosh, I'm really just in love with the white queen. I got to do the white queen sheep image or something. I could spend a month working on that mm. and not know what's the next thing, you know? And, and also not even know if, if I would finish the project. Most of the time it seemed like, you know, like in 2014, I think I made three images. And then 2015, I finished like six, but it wasn't really snowballing and becoming a thing until later in 2017. Wow, so. really impressive. I'm gonna share just a couple of comments real quick and then we'll turn to some questions shortly. Uh, Alicia Rodriguez says, thank you for sharing your process. People are interested in your process and I'll ask you some more questions about process because we have some of those. April Clark, loving this so much. Um, people are fanning on you. Uh, Pam Parnell, this is fabulous. I've been following her, you, you Maggie, for years and years and it's great to hear from you directly about your process. So thinking about process, another question we had was, when you say scan, um, uh, as in uh, scanning things that in your pictures, do you actually scan them on a flatbed or do you take pictures or how does that work? And you said you might um, take us on a tour of your studio. So if you could maybe start by telling us a little bit about your process. And I think that also might relate to looking around your studio a little bit. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, if I can put an object directly on the scanner, I do. And I mean, another thing I could do is open an image in Photoshop and do a screen share of that if you want to see how many layers are, are involved. 
Would you want to see that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and I don't think I'm alone. If I uh, share the screen and I tell it I want it to be Adobe Photoshop, and I say share, then I have to open an image. Uh, you are screen sharing. Okay. While you're doing that, I'll just mention when um, Maggie says if she can put an object on the, the scanner, she means any object. It could be a fish. <laughs> it could be yeah. a frog. I mean, I've had a couple of badly scratched scanners over the years, so that's not ideal. So can you see now the feast image there? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is just the real image, and this is actually done before I used very many smart objects. Now I use for people that are Photoshop users and such. So there's that background and then I have many layers above it. And sometimes in Photoshop, you can have a layer that has different, um, I wish I didn't have my picture there, get rid of that. Um, you can have layers that have different features to them. So this layer is multiplying and darkening that layer. Mm. And then I add color on different layers. Um, so this whole folder set here is called the hall and it becomes like a background stage set. And then I add something that's just a, a snapshot, a photo taken of a painting somewhere at a museum. I don't even know what it is. And then I add the table, which has many, many layers. And I like to leave myself a lot of leeway to change things in the future. So this has a table that you end up not even seeing under the, the Alice dress. Right. And this was in the beginning, 2017 was like the first time I really used smart objects. And for the people that love Photoshop, they know that's where you can then go into it and see it and manipulate it on its own. It's like a file within a file. So here I can have tons of layers of the girls, the dress. This was actually a photograph. Do you recognize that photograph, Eric? It was in a show at the Harn. I mean, a woman at the Harn, yes. Yeah, that your wife, Melissa, curated that show. And it said you couldn't photograph, but I took the picture and then my husband told me, no, you can't photograph it. So I photographed it and I came home and I thought it was just inspiring in terms of the color. And then I realized, okay, I can morph the one girl into a bunch of girls. So then I have like all the glasses, seven glasses or whatever. Each one is totally on its own layer. Like there's a little tiny glass down there. Whatever. It's obsessive anyway. That's probably more than people need to see of that, show all the layers. So, and as you go, as you scroll up, kind of clunky, as you scroll up, I have folders that have all the animals in them. So like, this is the rhino. The rhino is a smart object. Mm -hmm. And he's from a, an old engraving that I've ha had for years from a book. He's got a little mask on him and he's got some some adjustment layers on him to give him some shading and stuff. You see he's way in the back there, way on the back left. If I turn it on and off, you see how it's toning down the light on him. Every single animal has multiple adjustment layers. Oh, unbelievable, Maggie. That's why there can be like 500 things in there. So that's enough of that. <laughs> how wow. do I stop? Stop, stop. Let's see that. Stop this that's, one. Thank you for sharing that. That uh, gives us, uh, you know, the project is now both large in terms of embracing the 64 objects behind me and more uh, and incredibly large like in that that scale where you enter into it and you see this 500 layers of um, images making up an image fantastic uh, where are all those images and objects kept in your studio we we're wondering yeah so this is my like we, this is my, that's my workspace i have two monitors and a mac and that's like where i i sit all day and and work there. And then this is like, you know, just a normal bedroom sized room in the upstairs of my house. And I have mm, boxes of things that have, I don't know what in them. <laughs> and, and then I have flat files that have prints in them. And I have more flat files downstairs. And then I have a uh, scanner here but I, they're not very exciting. I have a couple of scanners, one's mm -hmm. bigger, one's smaller. And they're just, you know, ordinary. And I would put, just put stuff right on there if I wanted to scan something, but they don't have anything on them right now. This one's bigger. So anyway, and what else? So I sit here and work. 
Oh, could I switch to my iPad uh, for the viewing? How do we do that? Can I'm going that? to make that switch happen. There'll be a, a quick little blip. Um, Please wait here. And Maggie's coming right back now on her iPad. That's the iPad now. So I want internet audio. We can hear you, it sounds good. Okay, then uh, I see you, I'd rather see me. There we go, then I can uh, figure out how to turn my camera around so people don't have to look at my neck. Okay, so so for example, so this is, this is where I have my flat files, some of the flat files here, and I just set up a bunch of weird little stuff here for now. Normally, I keep all these daguerreotypes away because I'm, can you hear me okay, Eric? Yes. Okay, so I, I keep them away, locked up away from the light, you know? So like this is that image, mm -hmm. the plum cake monster, yes. and this is the original girl. Uh. I wanted to try to get it without, oh, no. there we go, no reflection. Like no, that. we can see it well, and thanks for bringing her out into the yeah, light. Yeah, so she's really rare because she has a weird white disc that would spin around behind the person. There's a name for it, and it's a very collectible, interesting image. It's quite old that would blur the background so that it could be a completely stark, plain, abstract background for her. Hmm. And these are just like such cool things because they come, you know, they're in these leather cases that... Each one has interesting details on both sides and different types of velvet. And you were supposed to display them at home kind of with this to help block the light so that you could see them like on your dresser or something. Right. So she's one of the Alice's, the Alice with the plum cake. How many Alice uh, daguerreotypes again did you use for your Alice's? Did you say 19? There's 22 different ones. Yeah. 22 Alice's. Oh, and then these guys are Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Sometimes it's hard to get, get away from the light. There we go. Yeah, that's pretty Tweedledee good. And Tweedledum. And actually, just this one is both. That boy didn't look as good. I tried either one, but the one on the left was so perfect. So he got copied and cloned, and he became both of the Tweedledee and the Tweedledum. And then eggs, of course, for Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and Oh, this is a thing that was my grandmother's Capodimonte vase that I just love. It's like oh my, a my guy throwing up into his own drink there or something. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And then maybe I can't have those lights on. Sometimes it's hard to know how but there's such a mirror because they're on this polished silver surface. It's very hard to get them to show exactly. Oh, there. No, there she is. You can sort of see her. She's a really nice girl with a really homemade dress. Like the appliques on her dress are obviously sewn by her mom. They're really quite beautiful. Or maybe her grandmother, I don't know. Yes, she's- uh, <laughs> We have like just weird cards in the studio here. This was my favorite growing up. This was a, this little orange guy is a pencil eraser mm -hmm. that I had growing up and I saved him all these years. I love him. That's the girl from the Humpty Dumpty image. She's the one with a mask over her face. Yeah, and she's got a really cool roses. And I think that there's something in the history of daguerreotypes and cased images where you can tell from the number of roses or the number of flowers on a pressed case what year it was made. But I'm not so up on all of that. Okay. There's another girl. So these were just so beautiful and so much fun to work with. And for most of these people, that's the only time in their life that they had a photograph made. You know, maybe if these girls were lucky, they later on had a wedding photograph or something, but it was still so rare back then for people to have that. And these are tin types. So they're just on a kind of more crudely coated metal piece of tin that would be much cheaper. And you could go and get multiples of them and give them out to your friends. So he became the conductor in the train car and she becomes Alice in the boat on the itch Tugney. I just got really excited. It actually caught my breath when I saw the dog, um, which oh. is, a, yeah, that dog there. Yeah, uh, so he's, yeah. He's the riddle about a dog that you mentioned. Yeah, 
So he's a carte de visite, which is a bit a bit of a later thing, like maybe 1880s or so. And that would be, there would be multiples, like maybe perhaps someone could even find the exact duplicate of him on eBay or something someday. He's made by Hastings in, on Tremont Street in Boston. And it was probably someone's special pet that they brought there. And I don't know what that harness is. What's the deal with, like, maybe that's where you would put your flask in there or something. I don't know what goes in there. Yeah. And he's not, I don't think he's taxidermy. I have another dog photo that I've used before that I think is taxidermy, but I think he was just posing very calmly. So, yeah. Nice. Then what else? Oh, nice. <laughs> Other taxidermy things. That's the white queen and yeah. she's quite old. Like sometimes you can tell if these have a more um, crudely simply cut mat without a lot of embroidery or anything or, you know, detail on it then and they have the fabric like this that's really simple and worn down and even this case is very very simple not much on it this is a much earlier image of that white queen she's quite beautiful and i got her and a lot of the images i've bought over the years i buy from a man in exeter new hampshire who sadly passed away recently dennis waters mm -hmm. who was just the most amazing collector of daguerreotypes. He had such a great connoisseur's eye for only getting things that were really beautiful quality. And this is the White King. And sometimes I buy things on eBay or at Mount Dora Flea Market, Renninger's Extravaganza, whatever. So, right. and then at the end here, so then I have my Hieronymus Bosch book. <laughs> if I just want to feel inspired and I want something to look at, I. I have books I've bought, you know, over the years, either in museums or on eBay or something. But lately, I'm just loving Bosch. I'm loving the the textures and the quirky, creepy images. I'm mm -hmm. getting ready to do some new still life images too. So, I wow. Love yeah. So, so then that's pretty much it. Like this is my small room I work in. Downstairs we have printers and everything and. I have works on the wall by friends over the years, people I've traded with and so on. Thank you so much for taking us on a tour. That was really generous to open your studio to us. Um, I'm gonna switch back to your other computer uh, uh, screen now. <laughs> one moment. Oh, now we're going back on this one. Yes. Um, we'll bring Maggie back. And there we are. So I have a screen full of well comments. I've read some before, and then I've got a lot of questions. I don't think we'll get through all of them. Um, some of them are technical. Uh, well, let me just dive right in. Um, so uh, do you still have the rabbit statue with a broken ear in your studio? Alice asked that. Um, <laughs> So here's a, uh, someone's asking, and this is really good since we're talking about the exhibition, what is the meaning of the Alice books for you? What drew you to Alice? Um, and what do you hope children and young adults and maybe uh, children at heart uh, will take away from the exhibit of your work? I just became fascinated by the intricacies of the story, both for the first book and the second book. and. I mean, I think in this day and age, someone might have even obsessed more and made it an even more finely crafted book. Yeah. But the zaniness of it is so interesting. And in this particular book, the, the nonsense poetry is amazing. It's just fun play with language and thinking about chess. I grew up playing chess when I was growing up with my dad or friends. And like, I don't do it anymore. I don't know why, but it's just, um, takes me back to that point in time. And I don't know, there's just something kind of still very fresh and strange about both of the stories to me. Yeah, um, they really are um, very readable and, and full of imagination, even though they've been illustrated by I think literally hundreds of illustrators. You mentioned that was a little daunting to you to think about that they'd been done before. Um, yeah, I mean, the original illustrations were very interesting. And you can actually go on the British Library and like on their website and you can download and see the original book. 
that Lewis Carroll illustrated himself with really funky illustrations mm -hmm. that are not the ones that we're familiar with. So the Tenniel illustrations are the ones that we know from the earlier, you know, black and white, beautiful, simple little, looks like Alice in a pinafore and stuff. But once I saw the original ones that Lewis Carroll drew, it's like, no, she looks like a brown haired girl and she's not wearing that kind of costume at all. It was interesting. And then in, in 1907 or so, the copyright was up. So anybody could put out new editions of it. And so there are a lot that are early 20th century, really visually beautiful versions of it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to look at all the versions. Yours are truly original and distinct and um, and visually rich. I mean, you, for instance, when you're showing us the queen and Alice in the boat, the goose and the sheep, and the subtle reflections that show them not as goose and sheep, but as queen and Alice in the water. There's so many details you could spend hours, which is one of the great pleasures of um, your art is that you can keep coming back to it, which is why I enjoy having your catalog. Um, Let's see, how do you choose the scenes from the book that you represent in your images? Obviously, it sounds like you, I think you said you made one image per chapter at least, um, but how did you decide which scenes would um, be uh, it's part of your story? It's kind of a slightly weird book because um, it's not even, like of the 12 chapters, it's crazy. The last two chapters are like one or two sentences each. One chapter is just a fragment of a sentence, I think it's chapter 11, so it's like, it's kind of modernist in, in that way. It's not like an even 12 chapters of density. So it was clear like chapters four and five where she visits with Tweedledum and goes with the white queen into this weird shop and onto the river, those needed a lot of illustrations. Other chapters, it was like, my gosh, she'd be lucky to make one thing for that sentence. There's like nothing. So um, I started just with the ones that spoke to me, like where I really wanted to make a Jabberwocky image, for example, and just did that. And then look through the rest of that chapter for anything else. One, like, for example, one of the ones I didn't want to do was the garden of live flowers, because I thought to me, talking flowers seem stupid. I don't know why it wasn't a part of the story I cared about, but I knew other people would want to see that. So I had to put faces in flowers somehow, you know? Um, so it was kind of a, I had a, a string in my studio with clothespins on it. And when I finished an image, I would make a small version of it and put it there, like a three inch little thing just pinned up on the clothespin in order. Right. And then I would draw on a little three inch piece of paper for the unfinished ones. So it'd be like just a drawing, like like literally a stick figure of a man. And that's gonna be the white, white king or something, you know? So that was kind of a notational drawing. Is drawing ever part of your process or do you sort of go immediately from gathering images to throwing them up on the screen and working with them? I don't draw in real life on paper at all, but I do draw in Photoshop. So you, you can just have a new layer in Photoshop and take your pen tool. And I have this, like one of these Wacom pens. So I don't, I don't like the mouse at all. So I can, I can draw in Photoshop. And the nice thing about that is it's so easy to throw it away or morph it or erase it or blur it or whatever you need to do. Mm. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. You're almost, you, yeah, when you started working with Photoshop, artists weren't working with Photoshop to speak of and digital imagery was not widely collected, I think in museums 24 years ago. Um, that was a brave new world um, and you're fully immersed in it clearly you do your, your drawing and here we are talking. Um, so for you, what, what about working digitally for you has been freeing? What drew you, what, 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 what empowered you about it for it to become your creative um, medium? I like sitting at a desk. Yeah. So when I was in sixth grade, I was forced to take typing every day in school at a girls' school in St. Pete, Florida. So like our goal was for an hour a day, you typed whatever they put up on the screen, like idiot savant level typing. So I love to type. That's one of the things. And I'm just happy like not to have to be in the dark room with chemicals, even mm -hmm. though I did that for more than 10 years. I never really liked mixing up the chemistry. It just didn't feel like me and I didn't like breathing that and, and being there. So 
I think just sitting at the computer is so perfect. And I'm glad I have my Apple Watch to tell me to get up because otherwise I sit there for hours. Get lost in it. Mm -hmm. Can be like three hours goes by. Yeah. Oh, that's remarkable. And of course, you did a lot of photography. You um, started at Yale as an undergraduate and then did your MFA at University of Florida, where you did work that, do you feel like that that photographic work in this in the dark room on paper with um, developers shared something in common with your, what you're doing today? Yes, in the sense that it was color and it was my first experience working in color when i was an undergrad we were only allowed to work in the black and white dark room so then suddenly when i had color it was like you can go crazy and develop your own color palette and have your own look and think about color so coming from black and white to color was really really good um and i mean also like just the limitations are always there no matter what you're doing you know like i i'm not doing 3d and i know people now could be doing 3D and all kinds of video and other stuff. Right. For me, my limitations are I'm not going to learn all that at this point. That would be really tough. But if I could, I would. And so, like, I came from a more limited black and white dark room to the color dark room. And then suddenly, when I had the computer, it was like you could do so much more. Wow. And you have done so much with it. I'm looking at our, our questions. Uh, again, it's invisible. Um, I love your backgrounds and your images. Do you use historical paintings, bits and pieces? For example, the umbrella trees. Well, we do know you use historical paintings even when you're not supposed to, becoming a woman photograph. Um, the umbrella trees. <laughs> oh, well, so yeah, I do. Um, I use old engravings sometimes. I'll, I'll like, if I buy things on eBay, I can sometimes buy a whole book of botanical images or just an individual image on eBay. Like an individual image might be like $5 or $15, depending what it is. And so I look on eBay and Etsy and in antique stores and stuff for things that I could scan and use. But what I really like doing is photographing in museums. So I don't like to use stock images. I really, unless I have to, I, I don't wanna use something that I think somebody else can use the same thing. And I want it to be anchored to a particular feeling and a particular point in my life. So if I'm in a museum, for example, over the years, I've had the good fortune to be in all kinds of places, Vienna, Paris, Munich, and I love going to the art museums. So I just photograph with my cell phone camera. And it used to be an old point and shoot camera years ago, but I've saved all those to like a little Canon elf. So I just save those and they're not organized. I don't do the thing where some people would put a, a keyword with them, like to say elephant is in this image or something. No, I don't do that. But for me, my memory is just, I remember there's something that I saw in Munich that, that I think could relate to this. And then I go back and look through the Munich folder from 2007 or something. And I see those museum images and they're not perfect. They have the most wonderful weird glare on them a lot of times and crackles in the paintings or a lot of times I have my own reflection and I'm looking at the painting. So I love that as texture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone did ask about your organization system. So thank you for talking about that already. Um, and I love the way you work with accident and incident in your own photographs in the daguerreotypes that may have been degraded or damaged. It's that you embrace the temporality of things and the imperfection. And then you make these images that you work over so intensely um, someone asked how many layers do your images have? I think you mentioned 500 in one of them. I mean, it would be more typical years ago even to have like 40 layers. You know, if I think back to 2005 or something, I could have 30 layers maybe. And as Photoshop's gotten better and you have all these adjustment layers and you want to keep flexibility, I have more and more layers because I want to want to be able to break things down in the future and take something out of there if I want to. Right, that actually, um, someone asked about if you, once you use a daguerreotype in an image, do you ever reuse it for other purposes or is it a one and done because you like to leave it as a precious? Rarely, uh, rarely. So there are a couple of these through the looking glass ones where I used a same girl from Alice in Wonderland. 
And there's a couple of other times where I've just really liked one particular view of a person and used it. So if I really love it, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, so many artists have variations on their work. You know, like you could have a version that uh, to just today I finished working on an image that is a still life and has tons of flowers in it, but I might have a different variation on it in the future that has no flowers or fewer flowers or is different, but I liked something about the image and I might want to reinvestigate that. And I think that's something, you know, painters and drawers and everybody does that. Sure, absolutely. It makes sense. And um, I'm going to sort of, it's almost, it's almost uh, seven o'clock here. Um, I want to ask a couple more questions and then we're going to invite Mimi to, as our MC to close out our evening. Um, these are maybe, uh, well, so this is a little technical. Um, someone asks if you use the same colors throughout all your images. And I assume that's within a project. Um, do you save Photoshop color palettes to make them all coherent? Or do you keep, I guess, restarting with your color palette for individual images? I don't even know how to save the color palettes, sadly. Oh my God, you know everything about Photoshop. <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't. I have an app on my phone that's made by Adobe that's something where you can sample colors in the real world and it makes you a palette. And I kind of like it just to digest colors, but I've never exported them anywhere else. I just sometimes like it if you if you walk up to something in real life and you're like, there's something different about that. And you can take a picture of it and it, it analyzes the color palette. But no, it's just my color sense. And like, I've noticed over the years, like if I teach workshops and we give everybody the same images to work with and you say, we're all gonna make this today and work, this is our exercise, we're gonna do this. They all come out different. Everybody, you know, someone likes bright pinks and blues, someone hates them. I like olive green and brown and sometimes a cyan, you know? So we just each have our own color palette. And if you work enough, it just kind of comes out. Cool. You just mentioned teaching workshops and someone says, I know you teach in-person workshops. Will you ever offer online classes? Please do, smiley <laughs> face. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's a whole new thing with the coronavirus and stuff. So I had something scheduled this summer that all got canceled, sadly, because I was supposed to be in Colorado this week right now instead of here in the rain. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I am with Santa Fe Workshops doing an online class, but we already had a backlog of people that were supposed to be signed up for the real class. So they let them sign up first. So now we have to offer another one, maybe in the fall, it'll be maybe September or something, I don't know, to do another one. So there will be from Santa Fe Workshops in the future. Alrighty, thank you so much for letting us know. So Santa Fe Workshops is your answer to watch for? Yeah couple things I would like to mention. One, you showed us again, the dog, I keep talking about the dog, the riddle about a dog. And you said that you decided not to tell us about it. You actually did tell me about it in another um, context where you recorded some audio about specific works. And I'm gonna invite people to go visit our mobile audio tour, which looks best on a mobile device, but it does work on a, any web browser. And that's harn.oncell.com. And you can actually hear about the dog and its bone, and a few other works that Maggie has shared about. Th that will be available um, to you as part of the exhibition. And my mom know. even liked that. Do you like the, the dog and the bone? My mom liked that whole podcast or whatever that was that you did, the audio. She said, oh, I could listen to you all day long, but she never said that before. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can hit pause, right? We all need a pause button. Um, so Tammy, if you'll type in harn.oncell.com into our chat box, that will help people have that. And the other thing I want to, I uh, know you already mentioned, oh, I just want to say, thank goodness for this, was it a gallerist in Santa Fe who said, you should read Alice in Wonderland and consider. Yeah, this is John Scanlon and he was a great gallery owner. He and his son Wilson had this Verve gallery, but it's closed now. Gallery, yeah. They were really good. And he, he just kept bugging me. He thought I would want to make, uh, political illustrations for a while, like, you know, caricatures, sort of like you could find in, um, you know, New Yorker magazine or something like that. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. But then this Alice thing kind of stuck in my brain after a while. And it's like, you know, I should go back and read that book again. Well, uh, kudos to him for, for seeing that and for planting the seed. Thank you for your tremendous work producing 
those images and sharing them with them, them with us. We're looking forward to inviting our viewers into the Harn when we open. This should be in July. Please check our Facebook, no, please check our webpage, harn.ufl.edu. We'll be sharing information about when we're opening and our hours and um, how to visit us. So that's really exciting to look forward to that. Um, and then shortly after we will open the exhibition, Dreaming Alice, Maggie Taylor Through the Looking Glass, um, which is organized, I should say, by Carol McCusker, curator of photography at the Harn, who's been, I know, a great partner for you in working on this and is really committed to having, having it open and look beautiful. Um, Maggie, thank you for tonight. You were so generous in sharing your work and telling us about how, how you engage with it and sharing your studio. I can tell people loved it and I certainly did myself. So thank you, Maggie. Okay, and thanks. I didn't even have to put shoes on or anything. I know. Um, <laughs> and thanks to Sten too for all of his support. I know he he was in the background helping out. Yes, uh, he, he is my little helper over right. there. <laughs> all righty, we'll be seeing you very soon. Okay. Fingers crossed. I'm going to- Do I need instructions or I just close my computer? You can, we're going to put you in the waiting room and you can log out. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. And here comes Mimi, our host for the evening. If I'm not catching her off guard, she'll be joining us. And there's Mimi. Welcome back. Hi. Thanks, Eric. Um, and a huge thank you to Maggie. That was awesome. So cool. Um, her images are just so complex and it's really interesting to see her problem solving process. Um, Wasn't it fun to see some images that you and I have been looking at for a while, but then back it so up long. and realize yeah. It, yeah. what might have been the different directions they, yeah. they, they could have gone in? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, huge thank you. And a uh, huge thank you to everyone that is watching at home. Um, we really are glad that um, you can still engage with us during this time. Um, if you're feeling inspired by Maggie's process, um, I encourage you to check out our website, harn.ufl.edu. Uh, we have a section on our homepage called Harn at Home. There you can find about three or four different art activities uh, that are based on Maggie's processes and about Dreaming Alice, the Alice story. Uh, they're for anyone of any age, so I really encourage anyone uh, who's feeling creative and inspired to go check those out. We also have uh, on our homepage a uh, tab called Watch and Listen. There you can find videos with our curators, and there's currently a video with Maggie that um, you can watch if you want to learn a little bit more about Maggie's process. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have... Uh, mobile tours that uh, anyone can check out for free. Uh, if you go to harn.oncell.com, that's harn.oncell, O-N-C-E-L-L.com, uh, you can see mobile tours of uh, objects in our collection and different exhibitions. So definitely check that out if you're interested in seeing more of our works. Thanks, Maggie. There's one last question that I'm gonna address here because um, I wasn't able to get to everyone's questions and comments, but thank you so much everyone for participating. I'm sorry we couldn't address them all, but the very last comment or question was Santa Fe, New Mexico or Santa Fe College, which is a great question. And we should have said Santa Fe, New Mexico. That was Verve Gallery and, um, and the Santa Fe um, uh, um, workshop she does. Um, so you look those up online. It's not through Santa Fe College. All righty. Thanks again, uh, Mimi, for hosting us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Wish Thank everyone you. a good night. Everyone, good night.